All right, you ready? Okay. Keith, I'll say the same thing to you that I said to Ari a bit ago, and that is, I think this is a superb film. I don't know what I was expecting. I really didn't know that much about it, but it's a really superb film. Well, thank you. And here you are. It's really your debut, isn't it? Well, it's it's my second film as a as a writer director. Um, but the first was a very small independent film called The Chocolate War, and uh, this is the second one. And this one took the last three and a half years of my life just to get it done. So it's been uh, so this is the, the broadest audience that the film I've done yet will hit theoretically. Is it that old thing you just couldn't get the financing, couldn't get people to believe in it, or what? Well, it was funny. Those were almost separate issues. People believed in it like crazy. We went to every studio in town, and everybody loved the story and was moved by it. They just didn't think that they could sell it or make money on it, and were scared of the politics of it. And people didn't want to see an anti-war movie, and people, you know, people didn't want to see World War II question. That's the one war we felt good about. People would say, well, make it Vietnam and we'll do it, or make it that no one dies and we'll do it, or make it that it all works out okay and we'll do it. And first of all, it would have been horrendous because it would have demolished the story. It also wouldn't have been staying true to William Morton's life. I mean, I wasn't going to take a man's life experiences and to start playing with them because Hollywood happened to feel like it. But within saying the truth of the story, it was very hard to actually get the money. And people kept almost doing it and then backing out at the last second. And, you know, people would come through with money and then their boss would get fired. I mean, Hollywood's notorious for firing executives every month, and we had that happen a couple of times, that we'd finally find someone to back the film, and then their regime would change, and there would go our, our financing. What was your budget? The actual, the actual production budget um, was just about $4 million. Uh, it was, uh, there's, they sometimes the producers say oh, oh, about five because it was about a million in costs. It had nothing to do with making the movie. It had to do with paying back old development costs and things like that. But what I actually had to go out in the woods with and make the movie was for. What do you want people to get from the picture, Keith? Well, um, well, first and foremost, I hope that they're moved by the picture. I mean, more than just a just an intellectual idea. I hope that they're af viscerally affected because I think that's what really leads to people thinking about something. Um, if you just say, well, here's a statement, you know, people will either nod if they agree or shake their heads if they don't, and then they'll go home and forget it. If you get under their skin with characters in a story, that's when there's a chance that they'll have to sit with it and think about it. But I hope people think about war and what war means. I mean, so much of what Ari was saying before was so, so articulate about the loss of war and the devastation that war creates. Um, even in a war like World War II that I was brought up, you know, I, I, I'm Jewish, I was brought up in New York City, as that was a good war, my father was in that war, that was the one right and wrong cause. But even in that, it still ultimately boiled down to children shooting at children, uh, you know, when you got out to the front lines, and that that's always insane and always horrible. And that even if a war might be morally necessary. It's not something to glorify. It's not something to celebrate. It's not, it's not about parades. It's about some, the most horrendous and awful thing that people do to each other. And if, on those rare occasions that it's unavoidable to stop a Hitler, it's unavoidable, that doesn't make it something glorious and grand. So I guess my feeling is if it makes people kind of just ponder those questions a little bit. Uh, if some 18-year-old kid who's, you know, not grown up in a time that we've had much war, and the little war that there's been has been like the Persian Gulf, something on a video screen that wasn't very real. If this makes him think about the flip side to the Rambo movies, and the, that will, that'll be something. But I, I more than anything just hope people are moved by it. I, I mean, I don't think you set out just to make a statement. I, I think that it was a good story that touched me and made me just thought, think about my own life and forgetting the war issue even, just my own moral choices and, and, and how hard it is in the world, how confusing the world is to know Am I really doing what's right? You know, whether it's in making a movie or dealing with other people. War just takes those same issues we all face all the time and elevates them to an extreme degree. In a way, I always think of this as not so much a war movie as a, a movie about these people who happen to be in a war. So. And it was going on at the time of World War II. Yes. Yes. The kind of confrontation that, I don't want to give away the plot, but the kind of confrontation Fort Worth. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I bet he's really disappointed that he can't be. He's, he's shooting a film up in Vancouver right now, oh, he, which I'm uh, sure is the only reason that he didn't come down as probably. well. Probably. Oh, yeah, because I think he would yeah. jump at any opportunity to come here. Oh. Well, that's yeah. too bad. Oh, well. 
Well, we'll tell him about it and <laughs> kind of lord it over him and make him feel very jealous. <laughs> Keith, the kind of confrontation between the Germans and the Americans uh, in this picture, A Midnight Clear, did that kind of thing truly happen? Well, according to William Morton, uh, when I finally was able to get him on the phone, he's very reclusive, uh, basically everything in the film is true. Uh, what you see is basically what he experienced. And uh, all of the even odd and surreal seeming elements, he said, were indeed what happened, and that it was like being in the middle of a surreal painting. I mean, all the rules were breaking down. Nothing, even in the craziness of a war, usually there are certain rules about the way you conduct a war. And even those were starting to break down. So it became this kind of odd, sad, funny anarchy where nothing quite made sense anymore. Uh, mother, the character Mother keeps talking about, I, I'd rather just shoot at them and have them shoot at us and you know, know what we're doing. And, and I think that that's a lot of what made him want to write about this, was to be in a situation where, however crazy it is, it got to a whole other level where no one knew what to expect. And he says that all the, the images, the frozen soldiers early on in the film, all the confrontations with the Germans of all the various types happened as they happened in the book, and, and we stuck fairly faithful to them in the film. Has he seen the film? Yes, and he was very happy with it, which made me very happy because when you're making a film of a man's life and probably one of the great turning points in a man's life, you'd hate him to not like it. <laughs> um, so it was a great relief. Uh, we sent him a tape in France and he saw it and we got a letter back that was very moving and very powerful and actually we, he allowed us to even quote from it in our press kit, you know, just saying basically you know, how, how good it felt as a writer to see a film that stuck true to the intent of the book and how it made him really think about the real people and the friends that he had lost and, and uh, that felt really good because it would have no matter how much anybody else liked the film, it would have felt awful to walk around knowing that the man who had lived it sat there and didn't, didn't respond to it. I don't know what your age is, Keith, but the fact that you are very young, was that ever a problem in your trying to uh, be the director and work with these crews and work with these actors? No, because I just always carried a large shotgun and it just kept them in line. It was amazing. Um, no, it was, first of all, it was a very young cast and crew. So um, I was still older than most of them. Um, and uh, people were really there because they loved the project. It's, it's not hard to keep people in line when they're excited about what they're working on. Not just the actors, but just about everybody in the crew had read the script. Many of them had done much larger films than this and were taking significant cuts in pay because they believed in what the film was about and wanted to be a part of it. So there was a real good spirit on this. And it was, you know, there wasn't a lot of keeping people in line. It was. People were there because they wanted to be. They knew going in that it was going to be long days in the cold and the snow, and, and, and they weren't there unless they were excited. So it was great. I didn't have to yell. You know, and, and, and one of my big goals as a director would be to get through a film without ever yelling at people, without ever having to lose my temper, with it being a real c collaborative experience, because I think the best films are that. I mean, I, I don't care what your talent is. I don't think any one person can make a good film on their own. I think good films are made by actors, crew, every position of the crew, director, producers, everybody coming together uh, and, and working together well. And that was, this is one of those rare cases where it really seemed to happen, where, where we set up a good atmosphere and people, everybody was, I mean, I had, I had crew people coming up with new ways to move cameras through the snow and we didn't have any money for like steady cams and a lot of fancy gadgets and, you know, one of our grips designed this weird sled thing that our cinematographer was able to sit in and be pushed through the snow so that we could get smooth shots going through four foot deep snow and we just, he just built it on his own initiative. We didn't even ask him for it. He just thought it was something we might be able to use. And that kind of spirit really made making the film a great pleasure as well as, as, well as an exciting piece of material to work on. It was just fun and it felt like everybody was as excited as I was. So. Well, I hope it does well for you because I'm very high on the film and I hope it does well for all of you. It certainly deserves to do well. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Linda facing him down the path from Will's point of view, that was done on the sled. Um, the shots both of Will's face and from his point of view when he's walking through the snow and saying, you know, I, 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 when I realize how beautiful the world is just when I might be leaving it. Basically any time you were with them going through the middle of snow, we used that. There were about five or six points in the film. And uh, it, it worked great except for the one time it ran me over. But other than that, it was, uh, 
Oh, that was I think the third day of shooting, and I think everybody thought they lost the director because I was running ahead of it, you know, watching the shot, and I just tripped in the snow, fell down, and the sled just went right over me, and nobody had any idea if I was hurt. <laughs> Luckily, the snow was so deep and so soft that it really was fine, but I think there was this real panic moment when they all felt this big kerchunk, kerchunk, and thought, well, here goes the movie. I guess it's time to pack up and go home. Uh, but luckily, it was the snow was so deep. It was maybe like five and six feet deep in places, and it was real soft, which was beautiful to shoot. And it was also impossible to move it. I mean, actors would disappear and not be found for hours at a time. But it was like, where's Ari? I think he's sunk in the snowbank over there. It's like, oh, okay. And, uh, okay, great. That's your